It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing, the cosmic system. Therefore, the next few moments as part of our standard operating procedure is for you to go through this process. If necessary, name your sins to God, be in fellowship, and be prepared for the concentration on the Word of God. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege, opportunity, and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit assemble this small portion of the Word which we will note tonight and put it into our souls through our concentration and the filling of the Spirit. We ask these things in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Now on your composite sheet the composites of Satan that is and by the way we need to make more of those because we need to send them out to those who are ordering and uh, you don't have a composite sheet well uh, it might be on the table I could give you mine I don't need it but we need to make more of these because I need to send them out as well people order Satanology they need to have these cards so some of you may have to sacrifice a card until we can get some more so what we have here are the uh, composites of Satan we've noted self-righteousness or relative righteousness as uh, has come up in 2 Corinthians 11:14. he masquerades as an angel of light we've noted deception and how he schemes We've noted his violence. One thing we've kind of left out, though, is his super genius. Something that I thought about today as I was studying. I thought to myself, super genius. One thing we haven't studied as part of the composites of Satan, but he's a super genius. And he uses this genius as a way to take you astray, believe it or not. You know what it's called? This is what it's called, and if I misspell it, it's because I'm not an intellectual. But this is what it's called. Intellectual arrogance. Intellectual arrogance. Is that spelled correctly? No? Well, I'm not an intellectual, and I'm not an intellectual arrogance either. But what we have is intellectual arrogance. That's not how you spell it. How do you spell it? I-N-T-E. Here? Here? Well, I'm no whiz. That's for sure. It looks odd. If you're wrong, we'll make fun of you, not me. Intellectual arrogance. Now that's part of Satan's super genius. As an intellectual, he comes up with all types of intellectual theories. One of which is the Big Bang Theory. Oh, people think that's intellectual. People thought Charles, Charles Darwin was an intellectual. He's not an intellectual. He may have been a genius. But he had with him an intellectual arrogance. And this is what people fall into. This is why people hop from place to place. And some people even hop into doctrine with this intellectual arrogance and they say, Oh, here's a fellow with a whole new vocabulary system. Here is a whole new system. I need to learn it. And then after a while they get bored with it and go to something else in their intellectual arrogance. They check out Buddhism. They check out the Big Bang Theory. They check out uh, Muslims. They check out everything in the world out of what? Intellectual arrogance. That's part of super genius. 
Now you don't even have a, have to have a high IQ to get involved in intellectual arrogance. You can have a low IQ and get involved in all the intellectual ideas of the world. And it's all created by Satan. Through his super genius, he has created many of these intellectual so-called systems. So what we need to note now is that Satan has a power system. And he has a power system over the control of others. A power system that is over the control of others or seeks to gain control of others. This is where Satan has his organization of angelic creatures and he has a system of aristocracy, believe it or not. Even though Satan laughs at aristocracy among human beings, he has his own system of aristocracy among the fallen angels. And these demons do have extensive powers far more powers than we do as human beings. Some of those angels under, fallen angels, under the command of Satan, one of them is called Abaddon. He's one of the highest ranking angels under Satan, fallen angel. Abaddon, spelled A-B-A-D-D-O-N. Abaddon. In the Greek, he's called Apollyon. That's A-P-O-L-L-Y-O-N, transliterated from the Greek, A-P-O-L-L-Y-O-N. We have Abaddon or Apollyon, they're one and the same. Just two different translations, one from Hebrew and one from Greek. The Hebrew is Abaddon. Abaddon or Apollyon is actually mentioned in Revelation 9:11. Revelation 9.11 mentions Abaddon or Apollyon. He is a servant of Satan. He is a high-ranking demon. We won't go over that verse, but I'll just give you the verse. Also, in Proverbs 15.11, we have Abaddon. Proverbs 15.11. Now, if you were to uh, flip to Proverbs 15.11, you will not see the word Abaddon. Not at all. If you have a good Bible, they will explain at the bottom. It will say something about destruction, and it will say something about uh, destruction and what else? For those of you who have opened to Proverbs 15.11, what, what are the first two words in 15.11 as translated in your Bible? Hell and destruction. Hell and destruction is one of them. And yours says Sheol and Abaddon. Well, that is absolutely correct. My note says Sheol and Abaddon. Well, that's absolutely correct, too, because he got his notes from the colonel. But Proverbs 15:11, Sheol, or at the bottom of the Bible anyway, Sheol and Abaddon. Abaddon's referring to Satan's second in command. Satan's first in command, Abaddon's second in command. Now in Job 28.22, there is also the same mention of Abaddon. Job 28.22. And this means that in the attack on Job, there were other angels involved as well. Fallen angels. We're talking about fallen angels right now. Job 28 and 22. Now in the Hebrew, it refers to Abaddon again. Abaddon the second highest ranking fallen angel A B A D D O N in the Hebrew in the Hebrew in the Greek again A P O L L Y O N Apollyon and actually Abaddon controls or commands one of the demon armies there's more than one demon army and since uh, Satan is a great organizer he is also a great delegator he has to be and why because once again, Satan is not omnipresent. And most stupid believers run around thinking that Satan is omnipresent like God is. Like Satan can see everybody. He cannot. He is limited in that way just as we are. We are at one place at one time. Satan is in one place at one time. And I doubt he's here. I guarantee you, he's probably in Washington, D.C., trying to put in a few words to uh, sway the president. 
or he might be over in the Middle East somewhere. He definitely uh, has a lot of bigger eggs to fry than this little church, I'll guarantee you that. So Satan is not omnipresent, and therefore he has to come up with a system, and he's come up with an amazing system called the cosmic system. And people, Christians will run around, Christians who know nothing about Bible doctrine, will run around and say, Satan's after me. Satan's not after you, you're after yourself. You've gotten involved in certain things yourself, and now you're under self-induced misery. You blame it on Satan. It's not Satan's fault, it's your fault. Why is it your fault? You haven't gotten with the Word of God. You've justified everything you've done. You've deceived yourself into thinking you're always right and you're full of self-absorption. You're under the arrogant skills. You're on the side of Satan. Satan's not after you. He doesn't have to be. You've already made your choice to be an enemy of the cross by not following the word and by going in for the cosmic system. So Abaddon is one of the highest ranking under Satan. And he commands one of the greatest demon armies. Now Satan does function as an enemy, but he does through mainly through a system. He does so mainly through a system. And he doesn't do it directly except in a very few cases, such as Job. And I'm sure he did it with the Apostle Paul. You want to know something about the Apostle Paul? The greatest Bible teacher ever. Before he died, there was one person by his side. One! The greatest Bible teacher ever. Once his ministry was through in terms of his life being finished and he had accomplished what he should have accomplished, one person was by his side and no one else, and that was Luke. Imagine that for a moment. The greatest Bible teacher ever. And who's by his deathbed as it were now of course his head was chopped off but he knew it was about to happen so who was by his deathbed Luke that's it and a lot of people think that churches have to have members that was, that's always a problem probably even a problem in the mentality of some of the people who attended this church in the past gotta have a lot of members no you don't who was by the Apostle Paul's side as the greatest teacher ever? One man, Luke. And now look what happened to the Apostle Paul's ministry. It goes on to this day. So Satan does function as an enemy. That's why only Luke was by the Apostle Paul's side. He is an enemy of the church, as we've noted. Number one, I will give you eight points on what how Satan functions as an enemy, many of which we've went over before, therefore there will be no reason to look at some of these verses because we've been over them before. Number one, he's an enemy of the church. Revelation 2.9, we've noted that. Number two, the church is called a synagogue of Satan when it is full of legalism. We noted that from Revelation 2.9. We studied that yesterday, and for your own benefit, after church, look it up. Revelation 2.9. I'm serious about it. Look it up. Revelation 2.9. The church there is called the synagogue of Satan. Why? It's full of legalism. Number three. When the church is attacked by religion, well, that's a satanic attack. And when it is, when it is attacked by religion, it is called the throne of Satan. Revelation 2.13, we studied that yesterday. But look it up again, because our memories are short. When the church is attacked by religion, it is called the throne of Satan. Revelation 2.13. That means that in some churches where nothing but morality and religion is taught, that simply means they're a church of Satan. And that's a fact. Point four. When the church is attacked by false doctrine, it is called the deep things of Satan. Revelation 2.24.
Now again, the beginning of Revelation is not dealing with the tribulation. The beginning of Revelation actually deals with the church and how churches had gone astray. Some had stayed firm and some had gone astray. And you can look these verses up for yourself. Revelation 2.9, that was a church that went astray, full of legalism. Revelation 2.13, they were attacked by a religion called the throne of Satan, but they didn't fall for it. Revelation 2.24, they were attacked by false doctrine, and it is called the deep things of Satan. What is that? The deep things of Satan. From his super genius, he comes up with some very brilliant ideas. And it would be very easy for someone in intellectual arrogance to take on the composite of Satan of super genius. Just to pick up his intellectual thoughts. And they are intellectual, by the way. I mean, you have to be a genius to come up with a separate system from God. And he is a genius. And he sweeps many people away. But in Revelation 2.24, it is noted that they were not led astray by the deep things of Satan, meaning that church had it all straight when it came to doctrine. And when Satan attacked their thinking with false doctrine, they stood firm in the faith. They stood, fir they stood firm in doctrine. Number five, he is the enemy of Bible doctrine. He is the enemy of Bible doctrine. Oh, you can note, note that from many passages. You can note that from the fact that he twists doctrine. You can note that from the fact that when Jesus Christ was on the earth and he went through his evidence testing, Satan twisted doctrine. And when you twist doctrine, add to doctrine, or subtract to what the Word of God has to say, you are an enemy of Bible doctrine. Satan is an enemy of Bible doctrine. And there are some believers who say they hate the word Bible doctrine. You know what that means? They're on Satan's side, and they too are an enemy of Bible doctrine. Why would anybody be opposed to two words, Bible? Let me make it real to you. Opposed to two words, Bible. Doctrine. What's in the Word. And that's what they're opposed to. They're opposed to the Bible, and they're opposed to the doctrine. Simple as that. And it's amazing. And I've heard people say that. I just don't like those words. Bible doctrine. I hate that. Bible doctrine. What is Bible doctrine? Why? They want to go on emotion. They want to continue in their cosmic system. And they do. Therefore, they hate what? Bible and doctrine. Phenomenal, isn't it? But true. Very true. They hate Bible doctrine. And they are the enemies of Bible doctrine. And they've fallen on Satan's side in the cosmic system. Let them be and have nothing to do with them. Nothing. Well, if they come around, be nice to them. Other than that, have nothing to do with them. Number six. He is the enemy of Israel. He is the enemy of Israel. And today is probably one of the best days for me to teach this. As the enemy of Israel. He is the enemy of Israel. He attacks Israel. Jimmy Carter had something to say about it today. He said, well, Israel had uh, two soldiers taken. So, they have thousands of people in their prisons talking about terrorists. Yes, Israel does have thousands of terrorists in prison. But he was making an, an equivalency. And that's what Jimmy Carter said. But who cares what Jimmy Carter says? His administration was 26 years ago. He was a peanut farmer. He has a peanut for brains. Who cares? Why do they even put him on TV anymore? Peanut farmer with a peanut for brains. But in the cosmic system, and a believer, he is an enemy of Israel. That is Satan and Jimmy Carter. He is an enemy of Israel. Revelation 12, 4 and 13. Revelation 12, 4, 12, 13, 12, 15. All of this we should know. Number seven, he is an enemy of Christ. We know that. That's obvious. And number eight, he is the originator of all violence and murder. And we've noted that from the composites of Satan. That's obvious. 
So a lot of this is review, a review to you. But how Satan functions as an enemy, those are the eight points. I'll go through them very quickly so to make sure you've got them right. Number one, he's an enemy of the church. Number two, number two the church is called the synagogue of Satan when it's full of legalism. That is legalistic churches today. Church of God, the Mennonites, Church of Christ. All these legalistic churches are the synagogue of Satan. Number three, when the church is attacked by religion, it is called the throne of Satan. Number four, when the church is attacked by, attacked by false doctrine, it is called the deep things of Satan. Number five, he's the enemy of Bible doctrine. He is the enemy of Bible doctrine. And so are a lot of believers. He's the enemy of Israel. So are a lot of believers. He is the enemy of Christ. And a lot of believers are the enemy of Christ without even knowing it. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I, even now weeping, say that you are the enemy of the cross. Believers! Believers! In the cosmic system. Not unbelievers. We're talking about believers. In Satan's cosmic system become the enemy of the cross. And how do I know? Because they come up with such phrases as, you must invite Christ into your heart. Invite Christ into your heart is not found in the Bible. You're an enemy because you don't even know how to give the gospel. And nobody's going to be saved by you telling them to invite Christ into their heart or to dedicate to Christ. And a spiritually dead person cannot dedicate to anything. He's dead. When you're dead, you can't do anything. And yet spiritually dead people say, I can dedicate to Christ. No, you can't. You're dead. You have no option except to have God the Holy Spirit reveal to you the gospel. And that's common grace. And God the Holy Spirit does all the work. You don't do anything. You're spiritually dead. God the Holy Spirit picks you up by the nap of the neck as an unbeliever who is spiritually dead and gives you something that you could never understand otherwise. Spiritual phenomena. And he says, look, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Then the unbeliever has a choice. And he can say, I believe in Christ. And I've heard this argument. And they say, well, see, you're doing something there. You're believing in Christ. But guess what? When you believe in Christ, it is ineffective unless God the Holy Spirit makes it effective. But every time when you believe in Christ, God the Holy Spirit will make it effective. You had nothing to do with it. God the Holy Spirit did all the work in revealing to you the gospel and in making your salvation efficacious. You did nothing. Absolutely nothing. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Not of yourselves you did nothing. It is by grace you have been saved, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And people say, well, you're doing something when you believe. No, you're not. You are making a volitional choice, but even that volitional choice would be ineffective without God the Holy Spirit. You've done nothing. Christ did it all. Where was I? He is the enemy of Israel. He is the enemy of Christ. Number eight, he is the originator of violence and murder, which we know very clearly now. Now, Satan also has a strategy to control nations, which he uses very well today. Why is the whole world anti-Semitic and at, at least a little half, a little less than half of Americans? Satan. He has a strategy to control nations. He has a control over our nation right now and the world. Now George Bush is hated because he's a believer. But some of the things that are going on lately shows a lot of naivete on the part of our country. Number one, his strategy is based on conspiracy and deceit. Remember that from the composites of Satan. He is full of deceit. His strategy is based on conspiracy and deceit. Conspiracy and deceit explains the basis for war. Arabs lie. Every time I watch them on television, they're lying, lying, lying. They are experts at lying. I shouldn't say Arabs. 
maybe I should just say Muslims caught in that religion but most of them are Arab caught in that religion but it is Muslims caught in that there are a few Arab believers and therefore I guess I can't generalize that but let's say Muslims because that's religion and in their religion they lie and they are deceptive which is the basis for war why is the Middle East always a hot spot because it is the center of religion think about it Judaism is in the Middle East the Mohammedans the Muslims are in the Middle East the Sunni the Shia are in the Middle East you go a little further east and you got the Hindu and all of that. But either way, everybody looks at Israel and around Israel as the Mecca of all religions, and that's true. That's where Satan spawned many religions, right there in the Middle East. He spawned Mohammedan, Mohammedanism. He spawned uh, the fact that uh, Muhammad ascended to heaven, etc. He spawned these religious ideas all originating from the Middle East. So the Middle East is a hotbed for war. Why? Religion is deceitful. And people involved in religion are themselves deceitful. Therefore, war, war, war. The Middle East has, excuse me, always been a place for war. Before we came along, the British owned the Middle East. They couldn't handle them. They were deceitful people. But they did handle them for a while. And how did they handle them? Through a greater violence. That's all. British went in and the Middle East was a peaceful place for a short time while the British had control of them. They did not convert to Christianity, but they understood one thing. The British were more powerful. They must submit in humility. That's all they understood. Violence. They did not become believers, however, even though Great Britain went throughout the world spreading the gospel. So Satan has strategy to control nations. His strategy is based on conspiracy and deceit. Number two, he manipulates the nations. Verses to say this, Revelation 12, 9, Revelation 12, 23, Revelation 20, 3. He manipulates the nations. Satan manipulates the nations. He manipulates our nation. That's number two. Number three. Satan is the author of every world peace movement. Satan is the author of every world peace movement. Now that sounds contrary to what people think. But what people think are usually cosmic systems. But Satan is the author of every world peace movement, including the ceasefire in Lebanon. Satan is the author of that ceasefire. We signed on to it. It's not going to last. <laughs> Even today, you know, the United States said, all right, we'll sign on to this. What happened was this. I'll give you some inside information. Not that I'm smarter. I just watch a lot of news. Inside information. The uh, French and the United States got together, and the United States said, "All right, well, let's make, let's try to uh, make a peace deal, which is stupid to start with, but let's try to make a peace deal between the uh, Lebanese or Hezbollah and Israel." And at first, the United States said, "These are the terms of the agreement: Hezbollah must disarm, or it's not going to work." Hezbollah, in other words, Hezbollah, give up your weapons. Terrorists, give up your weapons. Not bad idea. And then uh, we followed all through this, and then at the end of it we said, international force will go in. And then we said, we're not going in there, we're too busy. And then uh, the United States, in a kind of backhanded way, said, you French handle it. <laughs> you put your troops in there, you handle it. You see, they were trying to say, we need an international force. And so the United States looked at them and said, All right, you be the lead of the international force, and you take your troops in there, and you have a ceasefire. We're too busy. You do it now. Kind of a backhanded insult, really. But the whole, th the whole thing ended up as uh, we finally agreed with the uh, French method. We finally went along with it. But it's kind of a backhanded thing because we told the French, we said, You French... 
You're going to leave this thing and you're going to put your troops in there. If you think this is going to work, you do it. You know what the French said today? Uh, we can't really send any troops over there. We'll lead the movement, but uh, we're not going to send any troops. You know why the French said that? Because the president of Syria called up the president of France and said, you send your troops in there and we will blow them up like we did the Americans in 1982. And the French backed off like cowards. Only thing I can think about the French is a white flag. So there's a lot of behind the thing, behind the scene things going on. But still, why even bother playing politics with them? Why not join Israel and just wipe out terrorism? But instead, uh, maybe we want to teach the French a lesson. Oh, you want to be in charge? Go be in charge. And now they can't do anything. But what has happened? Hezbollah is running around claiming victory. Well, this just shows you one thing. Satan has control of nations. And instead of getting in a bickering fight with France, France is not our ally. It wouldn't matter to me if we invaded France. They are not our ally. They're our enemy. And so is many of the nations in the Middle East, except for Israel. But Satan has a strategy to control nations. Now moving away from politics, because... <laughs> Satan gets involved in politics too. So he does manipulate nations, number two. Number three, he is the author of every world peace movement, including the ceasefire in Lebanon, including every world peace movement that you've ever seen. Number four, he is the chief opponent of the laws of divine establishment. He is the chief opponent of the laws of divine establishment. And... Satan seeks to break down freedom and sovereignty through the United Nations. He seeks to break down freedom and the sovereignty of any nation where establishment, where evangelism, and where Bible Christianity is functioning. Now that makes sense. That makes total sense. Once again, number four. He is the chief opponent of the laws of divine establishment. Why? The laws of divine establishment provide us freedom to meet here. You know, in some countries, if we met here and our neighbors found out about it, we would be turned into the government and we would be jailed or executed, one or the other. And I'm not talking about a small portion of the world. I'm talking about a majority of the world. In China, where they have a billion people, you can't practice your Christianity. You can't go to Bible class without a neighbor peeking through their apartment window and calling up the government and saying, I saw so-and-so having an assembly. Maybe they're assembling against your government. And they do this because they're part of Satan's system, an elaborate system. And so what happens? Chinese police knock on the door. What are you doing? Having a church service? You know you can't do that. Off to jail you go. No trial. Forget that. There's no trial in those countries. Oh, if there is a trial, it's all fake. Let's have a trial. Guilty. Go to jail. That's your trial. There's, there, there's, a, It's absolutely phenomenal when you think about all the world. And then the whole Muslim world... Well, that's another probably two, three billion, maybe a billion or more. I can't. I have to look it up on the internet exactly how many Muslim, Muslims there are around the world. But it's a staggering. Probably more than Christians. Definitely more than Christians. More Muslims than Christians. More than likely. Now, the reason why I say that, they include in their uh, consensus of, uh, or their census of uh, Christianity, they include all Roman Catholics, but all. Not all Roman Catholics are saved. A lot of the Roman Catholics are on the same side as Satan. A lot of Roman Catholics are anti-Semitic. The Vatican is anti-Semitic. The Pope and all of those all the way down through. They don't support Israel. They're in a religion. And religion is the devil's ace trump. And once you're in religion you will more than likely follow every system of Satan, including the anti-Semitic part. That goes for 
a lot of Roman Catholics, not all of course, but a lot of them. So number three, number four again, he's the chief opponent of the laws of divine establishment. He seeks to break down freedom and sovereignty of any nation where establishment, that would include us, he seeks to break down any nation where establishment, evangelism, and Bible Christianity is functioning. In other words, he seeks to break down the United States of America. While we're on the skids, we still have the freedom for what? Evangelism. And I still have the freedom to stand up and teach Bible doctrine. Even though nobody wants it, I have the freedom to stand up and teach it. That's divine establishment. And I can teach it as long as I want under freedom. You know, that's part of the Bible, by the way. Might as well tell you. In the Bible it says, Do not muzzle the ox while he's treading or while he's eating, etc. That's what it means. And, and, and it's not referring to money. A lot of people say, well, that means give money to the pastor so he can function. There's a verse right after that referring to money. This, re this verse refers to the facts, do not muzzle an ox. What do you do with a dog that's kind of vicious? Muzzling. Put this cone on him. Or you put a little thing on his uh, mouth so he don't bite people. Muzzle. Muzzle the dog. Well, that's smart because if a, a dog has rabies or something, muzzle him. If a pastor has rabies, muzzle him. But I don't have rabies. People may claim it, but I don't. But what you do is, uh, what it means, don't muzzle the ox, it means don't shut him up when he's teaching. What it actually means, if he wants to teach for six hours straight, don't try to shut him up. If you don't like it, leave. There was one man who didn't like it who fell asleep during the Apostle Paul's teaching and he fell out of the window and died. And the Apostle Paul went down and revived him. Not revived him. Well, what a, a pulled him out. Well, he was dead and he used a miracle. Resuscitated. That's right. Not resurrection, but resuscitation. And he resuscitated him from death. What did the man do? Well, the Apostle Paul had probably been going on for way more than an hour. Maybe two, three hours. Man sitting in the window, naturally. Well, he got comfortable, fell asleep, and fell right out. Well, that should be a testimony to a lot of people who try to muzzle the ox. Who's the ox? The pastor teacher. Muzzling. Shut him up. Start this. Start at this time. End at this time. And that's it. I muzzle you. You should have seen the look on some people's faces. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying this uh, as part of a, 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 a part of something else. But you should have seen the look on some people's faces when my mother one time requested... She said, you see, I, I love this doctrine that's being taught. Uh, maybe you could do one in the morning where, uh, for example, for uh, some of the people who would be available in the morning. You should have seen the look of hatred on some of people's faces. The look of, the hell you say, as if they have to go anyway. It, but that is part of the satanic system, to muzzle the ox, to muzzle the pastor teacher. Therefore, under the divine establishment principles, I have the freedom to stand up here and talk till 6 a.m. All of you will be to bed, but I have the freedom to still stand up here and talk. That's divine establishment freedom. And when people try to muzzle the ox, they're on the side of Satan. They have actually gone in for the cosmic system. They've gone in for the fact that, well, divine establishment says I can teach and speak as long as I wish. Freedom of speech. But people try to muzzle the ox. Also, there's an attack on evangelism, an attack on Bible Christianity and, and its function. There's already been an attack on evangelism. You can't have it in schools anymore. No one can get up and talk about Jesus Christ in school anymore. That is an attack on divine establishment. You know what? Anybody can get up in school and talk about the Muslim religion. In fact, I was taught the Muslim religion in school. I wasn't taught to follow it. I was just taught what it was all about. I was taught what Hinduism was all about. This was history class. I was taught what Judaism was. 
And I had such a good history professor who I believe, not professor, but he should have been a professor, but a good high school teacher who I believe was a Jew, but he even taught Christianity too. And he even taught, believe it or not, that there are two sects of Christianity. And he said there's one sect that says it's by faith alone and Christ alone and no works. He taught that. He did not believe that, but he taught it. And then he said there's another sect that says you have to believe and work. You see, I could t- he had studied. He was a man who had studied everything. Now just because you study everything and learn it academically doesn't believe necessarily you're going to believe what's being said. And he didn't believe faith alone in Christ alone from nothing. He was a Jew. He went on Ramadan. He took ve- he took his he was definitely a Jew. Not Ramadan. That's for Muslims. But he did the uh, Yom Kippur thing. And sometime in September, I can't remember, but he would take a, a vigil in September, and it happened to correspond with the uh, a Jewish holiday. He was a Jew, but he taught all the religions, and he taught that. There's a sect of the Protestants say faith alone in Christ alone. He didn't say it exactly that way, but it was implied. And then he said, and there's another sect that go more along with the Catholics. It's uh, faith plus. Believe plus. And then he taught Judaism. Not very much, though, because I think he was a Jew himself and didn't want to get in trouble. And then he taught what uh, the Muslim religion was about. And he taught what uh, all these religions, and I learned a lot out of it about the religions. It's all meaningless, but I learned a lot out of it. But the point is, we live in a country where you're free to do that. But guess what? If today you were to get up and say, well, it is taught that Jesus Christ is the Savior, he would have been kicked out. And in fact, uh, he did quit. I don't know if it was on his on his own accord. I think he got fed up with all the criticism. That man was criticized because he just simply taught everything, including Christianity, when he wasn't even a Christian himself, more than likely. But because he taught Christianity, more than likely he was forced out. That's my opinion. But uh, another example is the fact that a young lady was the uh, top of her class and she had to give a speech. And when she mentioned the name Jesus Christ, they cut off her speech. Now, if she had mentioned the name Muhammad, they would have let her go on rambling. If she had mentioned the name Buddha, they'd let her go on rambling. If she had mentioned that she was a Hindi or a Hindu, she would have went on rambling. She would have mentioned that she was part of Harry Krishna's whatever. They would have let her went on rambling. But when she mentioned Jesus Christ, they cut her off. That's satanic policy. That's an attack on divine establishment. We have freedom here to say what we wish to say. It was not school-sponsored. I mean, of course, her speech was school-sponsored, but it's not as if the school was saying, we agree with her speech. You can agree or disagree with anybody's speech. But the school shut her off because of one, actually, one name, Jesus Christ. They said, stop. You can't say this anymore. You know what I would have done? I would have started shouting and they'd have still heard me. Not going to cut me off when I'm talking about my Lord and Savior. I don't give a damn what environment I'm in. If I want to talk about my Lord and Savior, I have that freedom under divine establishment. Do I not? Not anymore. Why? Satan has a strategy to control the nations and his webs are getting into our nation. And it's starting at uh, the most basic levels, school. And why not start there? Because that's what mothers always seem to enforce. School. Education. You must have your education. You'll be a nobody without education. You must be educated in this, that, and the other. You must get your degree. If you don't, you'll be a nobody. And they enforce that, but they never tell them this. If you don't get with your spiritual life, you'll be a nobody in heaven. They don't enforce that. But they enforce this. You'll be a nobody unless you get your academic education, most of which is satanically influenced. Yet they don't know that. But they themselves are satanically influenced. 
It is absolutely amazing what's going on in terms of Satan's push today. And his push is against the United States because we are really the only free nation left where Bible doctrine is even taught. It's not taught in England. It's not taught anywhere else except right here. Bible doctrine is taught here by a very few amount of pastors, but it's taught here. It's not taught anywhere else unless we have a missionary from here go there. There's only one exception that I know of, and that's Helmut Mueller. And Helmut Mueller's from Germany, but trained under the colonel, who's from the United States. And he goes to Africa, etc. And he also has some influence in Germany. Very little. So he's the chief opponent of the laws of divine establishment, and he seeks to break down freedom and sovereignty of any nation where establishment evangelism and Bible Christianity is functioning. And bit by bit he's destroying establishment. And bit by bit he's destroying evangelism. And bit by bit he's trying to destroy Bible teaching. And it will get a lot worse unless more people wake up to the fact that Bible doctrine is number one. Number five, internationalism. Internationalism. Internationalism is satanic in any form. How do I know? Tower of Babel. Remember, there are four divine institutions. Number one, volition. Satan hates volition. Volition is what's going to send him to hell. Number two, family or marriage. Number two, marriage. Number three, family. Number four, nationalism. Every divine institution Satan attacks. He attacks volition through marriage, beginning. In the beginning, he attacked the volition of Adam through what? Marriage. But he used the divine institutions. He attacked family through what? Marriage. Marriage is one of the cords of society. It's one of those... Uh, Links. It's something, it's the pivot of society, really. Marriage. And where there's a society where marriage is falling apart, Satan has his teeth really sunk in. And marriage is falling apart in this country. And Satan loves it. And people get married and divorced whenever they wish and whenever they please. Yet in Malachi, the Bible says, God hates divorce! And yet it goes on here in this country right and left. There are some legitimate reasons for divorce. But why did Jesus Christ even make these legitimate reasons for divorce? You know what he said? Because of the hardness of man's heart, I made these reasons for divorce. Because of the hardness of man's heart. You know what that means? If a woman cheats on her husband and he finds out about it, he's going to get jealous about it. And he's going to become so jealous it might make his heart hard, definitely against her. So because of his jealousy, the marriage is broken apart. Is it because she committed adultery? Well, she had a hand in it. But it's because of the hardness of heart of jealousy as well. You see, uh, well, one of the prophets in the Bible, I forget his name, he stayed with a woman who had committed adultery on him. Not just once, but several times. He actually bought her out of slavery. I've taught this before. My memory certainly doesn't work the way it should sometimes. But Hosea, that's right. Absolutely. Hosea. And he bought this woman right out of slavery. Even after she had committed adultery on him. Not just once, but many times. So many times that he would have children and he would even name some of his children. Not mine! And that would be the name of the child, not mine. But he stayed with her! Why? He didn't have a hard heart of jealousy. And if he did have some jealousy, which would be a natural sin nature response, he rebounded it immediately. And he bought her out of slavery. And why did he do it? No jealous reaction. And if he had a jealous reaction, it was short-lived. And so divorce is because of 
the hardness of man's heart because of the fact that we can't forgive and forget. Now a person can commit adultery and they can go to God the Father and say, I've committed adultery. What's God the Father do? Forgives it? Forgets it. Yet if your husband or your wife were to find out about it, they're not going to forgive it and forget it. Why? Hardness of heart. It was designed in the beginning, and Bobby was right when he taught this, it was designed in the beginning that man and woman, one man and one man for one woman should stay married until they depart from this earth, or until one of them departs from this earth. That's the way God designed it. That's how God designed it. And a deviation from it, because of the hardness of man's heart, Jesus Christ did give reasons for divorce, legitimate reasons, and if you follow them exactly, you will avoid sin and you will avoid punishment by following God's commands exactly. But he only did this because of one reason. God the Father knew the hardness of man's heart couldn't take it. He knew that if some people stayed together after such a uh, terrible thing as adultery, that they would lose their spiritual life because of jealousy. I'm going off on a whole other subject, but the fact is uh, that Satan attacks marriage, and uh, that's part of the divine establishment, and we're falling apart as a nation because of it. So this is how he controls nations again. Number five, internationalism in any form, including the United Nations, is satanic. Internationalism in any form is satanic. And that includes the United Nations today. The United Nations today is the modern day Tower of Babel. That's it. And guess what? Every member of the United Nations is anti-Semitic except one, the United States. And yet we still seem to want to go along with the world sometimes. Well, I mean, if you're the President of the United States and you see that every member of the world votes against Israel, it'll make you think. I mean, if you don't understand these things of the Bible, it would make you think. It would make you think... Every nation in the world votes against Israel, and I'm going to support Israel. It would make you think, am I the crazy one? The whole world's going against Israel. I'm the only one for Israel. If you don't know these principles of doctrine, it would make you think that. It would make you think, well, does the world know something I don't know? Is there something in the world that I don't know? i tell you what you don't know, doctrine. That's the whole problem. But it's true. Satan has deceived all the nations in the world, including ours, but not so much so ours. So number five is internationalism. Number six is his policy in power politics. His policy in power politics, number six. This is Satan's policy in power politics. We don't have this so much in our country, but we're a rarity. And we don't understand what goes on around the world. But around the world in politics, what occurs? Violence! They don't have civil elections, they have violence! People control through violence. Saddam Hussein came to power through violence. Communism came to power through violence. Hitler came to power through violence. We're the ones who freed Europe. And Europe shows no appreciation for that whatsoever. So power politics includes violence, tyranny, and change. Whenever you get a politician, stand up, and the only thing he talks about, without reason is change you're dealing with somebody who's satanically influenced at least change we're gonna have change now they don't explain what the change is all about you see Fidel Castro who is either burning in hell or will presently go there or soon go there 
Fidel Castro talked about change. Didn't say what kind of change. He just went around Cuba and made a big fuss and said, we're going to have change. Change. And we have presidential candidates in our country who've run around and said, change, change. That's a satanic phrase. Now, that's because the change they go for is satanic change. Ronald Reagan didn't just run around and talk about change, although he did change a lot of things. He didn't run around and talk about change, change. He talked about, well, I'm going to cut your taxes. I'm going to limit government, divine establishment. I'm going to build the military, divine establishment. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. And he listed it out, and he got elected. And guess what he did? This, that, and the other. Then he got reelected in the landslide. 49 states. How do you like that, liberals? Not one Democrat's ever won 49 states. He won 49 states except his opponent's state of Minnesota. Minnesota hasn't voted for a Republican in a long time. But anyway, he didn't talk about change. He talked about uh, exactly what he was going to do, which was part of divine establishment. But I'm talking about politicians who really have nothing to say except change, change. We're going to have a change. We're going to change this as you know it. What's that mean? Well, they'll tell you what it means. So his power politics, his policy of power politics has to do with violence, tyranny, and change. Part of his function is to malign law and order. Part of his function is to malign law and and order. How do you malign law and order? Well, it depends on what the meaning of is is. Law and order. And that's what they do. Number seven. He is the father of religion. Satan is the father of religion. Chew on that one. Some of the things I have to teach forcefully and some of the things I have to use a language that people who are normally legalistic are not used to because they won't get it anyway. Just need to just need to uh, separate the wheat, wheat from the chaff immediately. I've done a very good job at that. He is the father of religion and also liberalism. Liberalism, by the way, is a religion. He's the father of religion. He's the father of liberalism. He is, Satan, is anti-military. Satan is anti-military. And you say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Well, God is pro-military. God wrote a whole book in the Bible called Numbers, being pro-military. God told Saul how to fight a war. Kill them all. Man, woman, child, infant, animals, all. So he's the father of religion. He is anti-military. And he is pro-welfare state. Why? He wants to create a perfect environment. Excuse me. He wants to create a perfect environment. He is pro-communist. He is pro-socialist. And he is against free enterprise. He's so much against free enterprise, he comes up with some weird things in order to attack free enterprise. You know what that is? Environmentalism. Do you know how environmentalism attacks free enterprise? Well, in many ways, but let me give you just a very simple example. Walmart builds a store. Walmart has its own capital. People have invested in Walmart. American citizens have invested in Walmart in which they take that capital and they build another Walmart. That's, that's free enterprise. And when you buy a property, shouldn't you be allowed to do with that property what you wish? Especially if it's commercial and you bought the commercial property, you're going to sell something. Shouldn't you be able to design the parking lot as you wish? And shouldn't you be able to design the store as you wish, etc.? Absolutely. But Satan comes up with something and says, environmentalism. You know what? You're depriving people of oxygen by depriving them of trees, as if the trees give us life. 
And so he makes Walmart put trees in the ground. <laughs> you look shocked, but it's true. And so when Walmart buys somewhere and if somebody comes along and says, uh uh, you're destroying the environment, you better build a tree here and you better build a tree there. And they take Americans' capital. Walmart now is a public entity. I can buy stock in Walmart. You can buy stock in Walmart. And if you do, when the government comes along and tells them how to do business, what they're doing is coming along and telling you how to do business if you own stock in that company. That is anti-free enterprise. That is pro-socialism. And they say they're doing it for the common good, but I could care less if there's a tree there or not. It's not for my good. So Satan has a strategy to control nations, and uh, many of these insane thoughts have come out of his super genius. And his super... In his, in Sa just think about this. In Satan's super genius, as part of his composite, he said to himself, How do I tack free enterprise in America? He's been unsuccessful thus far to a large extent. So he says to himself, I've got to attack free enterprise somehow. Well, let me scare people into thinking that the environment is bad. So he did so. And then through that, he's been able to widen government control over free enterprise. It might be a bit hard. It might make you have to think a bit about it to understand it. But all this environmental stuff, it's nothing but an attack on free enterprise. It's an attack on your freedom, too. When I went up to New York one time, you had to, uh, I just throw stuff in the trash. Oh no, you can't do that. Separate this, this, this goes here. Cans go here, bottles go here, this goes there. And they all have it separated out, and if you don't do it, they'll find you. It's nobody's business. Well, if they want to separate it out, well, let Satan separate it out. Maybe that would be a good job for him. But it's insanity that's, that's spread throughout the world, and part of it, actually all of it, has to do with the satanic strategy to control nations. And he comes about it from all different kinds of angles, and it's absolutely phenomenal. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to come to understand Satan and his strategy so we don't get sucked into it, and to uh, come to understand the importance of divine establishment, to understand the importance of freedom, to understand the importance that uh, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We ask these things in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.